Okay, I'm going to look at the process of transpiration, which is the evaporation of water through the stomata. Water has to go in through the root, travel across the root by osmosis, travel up the xylem using the cohesion tension theory, travel across the leaf using osmosis, and then evaporate from the spongy cells and diffuse out through the stomata. So I'm going to look at each stage in turn, but let's start by looking down at the root. So if you actually look at the root, this is how it's laid out. You've got the outer layer, the epidermal layer, with its root hair cells over here. You then got the packing cells. Then you have this endodermal layer, which is cells with a waterproof cell wall, known as a Casparian strip. You then got the xylem in the middle with this X shape and the flow around the outside. So we're going to take a cut through from the root hair cell all the way through the endodermis. And this is what it looks like. So you have your root hair cell, then you have your packing cells, then you have your endodermis finishing up with your xylem. So the first problem that the plant has is it has to take water into the root hair cell from an area of soil which is, normally has a lower water potential. So what it does is it actively transports the ions into the root hair cell, thus lowering the water potential inside and drawing water in by osmosis. The water will then travel across those packing cells in one of two ways. The first way is to go via the cell walls, and this is called the apoplastic pathway. And in the apoplastic pathway, it's all well and good until you get to the endodermis, because remember I said the endodermis contains something called a Casparian strip, which is an impermeable substance in its cell wall. And therefore, what it's not able to do is to take water via the apoplastic root at that point. And instead, it has to go into the other root and then onto the xylem. So we can summarize that by just saying that the water, some of the water, moves by, via the apoplastic root pathway, which is cell wall to cell wall, until it reaches the Casparian strip in the endodermis. It is then forced into the symplastic pathway. But what is the symplastic pathway? Well, the symplastic pathway is the other way in which water moves, which is via the cytoplasm. So it comes in, it goes via the cytoplasm, not through the vacuoles, connects through the plasmodesmata, the chains, and literally goes that way through. And that's not a problem, it can do all of that all the way until it reaches the xylem. So, rest of the water moves via the symplastic pathway which is cytoplasm to cytoplasm. So we've now entered the xylem. So now we need to look at the xylem itself. So if I scroll down a little bit, let's draw a little picture of the xylem. The xylem started off from its stem cells by being normal cells that were situated on top of each other like this. Completely alive, everything inside them as you would expect. However, as they matured, they deposited lignin in their cell walls. And that lignin is waterproof. And it made the insides of the cells die. And what ended up happening was that the end plates disappeared. And all you end up with is a single tube. There are places 
in the walls where there are pits so that water can go laterally out of them. But other than that, water will just move from the bottom upwards in this island. So we need to think about how does water go up? And in order to understand how water goes up, you need to go back to thinking about the structure of water. So if we think about the structure of water, we know that water is made up of H2O. And we know that the electrons that are being shared are closer to oxygen than they are to hydrogen, which means we end up with a situation where the oxygens are more negative and the hydrogens are more positive. And we call this a di polar molecule. Now, because of this, when water molecules come into contact with each other, they end up with attractions between the positive hydrogens and the negative oxygens. And that attraction is called a hydrogen bond. And it helps the molecules to stick together, to cohere together. So how does water go up? Well, the main way in which water moves, okay, I'm sure. the main way in which water moves is something called the cohesion tension theory. So it's the idea that as water evaporates from the surface of the soil, so I'm trying, sorry, from the surface of the leaf, Pulls up the molecules behind it. This is because the molecules, the water molecules, stick together via hydrogen bonds. Okay, so this is what we were saying before. So we call this. Cohesion. So as the water molecules evaporate, the water behind them is put under tension. And this is known as the cohesion tension. Causes the water to be drawn up the xylem in a continuous column known as the transpiration stream. So I liken it to imagine you have a group of people all holding hands in a line, but they're quite close together. And we tell them they're not allowed to stop holding hands. When we pull the person on the end, it will stretch out the line of people. That's the tension in the water molecules. And eventually, if I keep pulling, then obviously the whole line moves with me. Now, there is another thing that happens as well as the um, cohesion tension theory and that is also the idea that water molecules can carry out adhesion. Now adhesion is the idea that they stick to the walls of the actual xylem. So imagine it like somebody sticking to the sides with sort of sticky pads and climbing their way up the xylem. It's sort of a little bit like that. So it's also worth knowing that water molecules Add here to the xylem walls which enables them to move up the xylem. So you've got the combination of the cohesion tension theory and the adhesion which causes the water molecules to rise. Now we already said that once it gets to the surface then the water molecule once it gets to the leaves, then the water molecules obviously 
will evaporate out through the stomata. So if you think about the structure of a leaf, which we've looked at before, then the water molecules will move out. Now we're going to look at that a bit more in a minute, but before we do that, we're going to look at an experiment, which is called a potometer. Now you should have come across this before. It's used to measure water uptake. So you take a shoot, you must cut the shoot under water, so you don't get any air bubbles. You assemble the whole apparatus underwater as much as possible. You need to seal it with Vaseline to prevent leaks. And then you put in an air bubble and you watch how far it moves in a given amount of time. So for example, I might see that, that my water bubble starts at that there and it manages to move at say 20 millimeters in 10 minutes. Now what can you do with that? Well, if you think of this capillary tubing, what this capillary tubing is, is a cylinder. So if the air bubble has moved from there to there, that means that volume of water has been taken up. So if we know that that is 20 millimetres, and say we know the radius of our blue tube is one millimetre, then we can use pi r squared h to work out the volume that has been taken up, which in this particular case would be 20 pi. We could then say, well, if it's 20 pi in 10 minutes, then 20 pi divided by 10 gives us two pi per minute. And then you could repeat the experiment again, and you could repeat the experiment by obviously using the same species of leaf, practically with the same number of leaves, and passing wind over it so that it's in windy conditions or putting it under a light or putting it in a hotter temperature to look at the effect of different conditions on transpiration, obviously we're trying to control all of the other variables. So if we now think about our leaf, we already said, if you remember, so you that the we've gone up to the top of the xylem. So if you think about your leaf structure, okay, so you've got your upper epidermis, you've then got your palisade cells. You've then got your spongy cells, which have lots of air spaces. You've got your vascular bundle, which I'll draw in a different colour. You can see the difference between them. And your vascular bundle will contain your xylem and your phloem. And then underneath that, you have your lower epidermis, and within that, you have your guard cells, which we'll come back to in a minute, and your stomata. So the water's gone up to the top of the xylem. It will then move by osmosis into the spongy mesophyll cells. Some of it will make their way to the palisade cells, and then some of it will evaporate into the air spaces and then diffuse out through those stomata. So let's think about the stomata. We already said that we have our guard cells and we have our actual stomata. And we know that our stomata are mostly on the lower epidermis, not very many on the upper epidermis. And the guard cells can open and close the stomata. So if you have a look at a guard cell and stomata stoma from the top, you can see that the, the stomata can be open or the stomata can be closed. So you have an open stomata when your guard cells, which are here, are really turgid and full of water. And you have closed stomata when your guard cells are flaccid and empty. So 
In order to open the stomata, water is taken in by osmosis into those cells. And because of the way the cell walls are formed in that the outer layer of cell walls is thinner than the inner layer, hard for me to draw here, you end up with this curved guard cell and opens up that stoma in the middle. Okay, when water leaves, like so, then the cells become flaccid and the stomata close. Plants tend to control their stomata opening and closing, so they will close them at night um, to prevent water loss, but keep them open during the day because they want carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. So there's a careful and delicate balance between opening and closing your stomata. Now, the last thing for us to think about are our xerophytes. Xerophytes are plants that live in dry conditions. Now you've got things like a cactus, which you know about with its small leaves for its small surface area. But we're going to do another example, which is marram grass, because that's the example that often are used by the exam board. So if I draw a marram grass, first thing you'll notice is that its leaf is curled. It comes in. I'm not going to draw all of the layers. So and it basically looks like that. And there are a few things for us to notice here. So the first thing is, as I said, that it's curled. Okay, and it's curled for a couple of reasons. So it's curled because it reduces its surface area for evaporation. And it also traps moist air. And we'll come back to that one in a minute because we're going to explain that with another couple of examples. You then have these hairs, which also trap moist air. And you have stomata which are sunken, which also trap moist air. What do I mean by sunken stomata? So if I give you a little picture up here, instead of the stomata being like this, which is what you would expect normally, the stomata sitting down in a little sort of pit like that. So all of these three, the reason they trap moist air is because it lowers the water potential gradient, so water doesn't want to evaporate. Because if you're trapping water in here, then water is less likely to want to leave. And then the last thing to notice is that there is no or little waxy cuticle. And again, Oh, sorry, there's a thick waxy cuticle. Apologies. There's a thick waxy cuticle. Because that will allow and the last thing to notice is that there is a thick waxy cuticle again to prevent evaporation and that's what you need to be able to know about the xerophyte. I will cover translocation in a different